I am not Anna. <laughs> I don't look like an Anna, do I? All right, this is Luke 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone round them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Dangerous. Whoa. Mystery. <laughs> Lord, thank you for who you are. And today I do pray that we would be caught up in wonder, love, and praise of you. I pray that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that they would find the Prince of Peace, the one who bought peace. For us with God through his blood, through his atonement, through his sacrifice, and that they would leave here a new creature, born again. Lord, that's what we're praying for. That's what we're seeking for. I pray for those that are struggling with discouragement and difficulties. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in their hearts and remind them that they're part of an everlasting kingdom. And that you are with them and that you are in them, tabernacling with them in their hearts today, Lord, as you only can do. We pray for a demonstration of the spirit and the power in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Well, we read the whole narrative there, but I'm going to focus really on this time with the shepherds. Um, it's quite amazing when you think about that. I've titled this Lasting Peace. Often peace is explained or defined by the absence of conflict. You've heard it or even said, I do not have peace about this or that. Or could we just have some peace? What this tells me is that peace is a fundamental need for humans. 
God created us with the need to have peace. Is this actually possible? Yes, but not the way the world gives it. Peace is found only in Jesus Christ. And that's what this narrative, this time with the shepherd shows us this. Jesus came to bring peace. He came to bring peace because he is peace. And I hope this morning we really realize that, that if you have Jesus, you have peace. You have peace with God and you are reconciled. And that is an amazing thing. Imagine God in the flesh. And I think what's amazing about the incarnation and what's amazing about the narrative of Christmas is what we learn about our God by who he called to himself and how he actually appeared. And everyone that was involved in that, I think, shares with us the heart of God and his peace and characteristics of his peace. Think of it, Mary, 13, 14-year-old girl in the middle of obscurity, actually comes to her and says, you're going to bear a child. She's a virgin. Amazing, amazing thing. How about Joseph, you know, betrothed to this woman, and all of a sudden it appears that she's committed adultery, and he wants to put her away quietly, and yet he's young himself. And then Elizabeth, who's barren, who's well beyond birth, an age that she can give birth, and yet God shows that he can do the impossible. He is peace even over the physical world, as Dennis was sharing and as he lit this candle. How about Zechariah, the amazing, here's, here's a priest and happens to buy Lot, and yet Elizabeth and Zechariah are going to raise the forerunner the greatest Old Testament prophet out of the mouth of the Lord, the forerunner, the one who is going to usher in and prepare the way for the Messiah. And we see in that narrative, the, in, the, in the wombs, the, the Savior of the world meeting the Old Testament, the fulfillment meeting the Old Covenant and the promise. How about the Magi? Imagine calling these magi from way off in Babylon, these Gentiles, these unclean, these ones that aren't part of the promise, and yet God brings them to himself. That tells us something about the heart of God, and that tells us something about his kingdom and who he is, and I think that's amazing. And these shepherds, imagine these shepherds, Shepherds, the lowly of the society, the filthy of the society, the ones that provide such an amazing work, but yet not honored. What do you notice? There's not a lot of money involved. There's not a great pedigree. There's not comfort. There's certainly not going to be ease. And imagine the Savior being born. We kind of dramatize it or romanticize it, but really, the Savior was born in filth. He was born in a cave, in a manger that stunk. He was born in absolute humility. God came in a way that showed complete weakness, and he brought salvation out of weakness. What an amazing, he came to bring peace. You know, Often we think of peace as an absence of conflict or an easy life, but actually peace, shalom, means wholeness, completeness, rest. It, it, it establishes you. There's an establishedness. There's a security and a stability that the peace of God brings because he brings himself and he is your peace. He is the one that brings rest to your soul. In John 14, 27, Jesus actually talks about this peace. And listen to what he says. He's talking to his disciples here, and he says, Peace I leave with you. Wow, that'd be amazing. Wow, Jesus is going to leave his peace with me. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, do not let your heart be troubled, nor let your, 
let it be fearful. And Jesus is showing something. He's comparing and contrasting. If you want the world's peace, your heart will be perpetually troubled and in fear. Perpetually. But his peace actually brings a security. Because what Jesus is saying there is he's saying, I'm going to give myself to you. And there's perfect peace in Christ. And that is an amazing, amazing thing. Imagine these shepherds. So we, all of a sudden these angels surround these shepherds. They're out in the fields outside of Bethlehem. And they're raising possibly the Passover lamb. I mean, they, they, they provide a lot for the temple. And here they are on the outskirts. Don't miss that. Luke doesn't want us to miss that. That's so key to the narrative of the gospel. That's so key to our hope and our peace, how God came, what he did, and who he came to. He's coming to these outcasts. Imagine these shepherds, outcasts, necessary, catch this, necessary for the functioning and the rituals of the temple, but shunned and seen as lesser value. So imagine that for a second. All the Pharisees, all, everyone is dependent on them to provide something so that they could have some peace with God, and yet they are not allowed to go to the temple. They are shunned. They are kept outside. They are literally seen as ceremonially unclean. And we are ceremonially unclean. We have no peace. We're born in sin. But God comes to us and brings us in brings us into himself. Imagine these shepherds who know and feel and understand that they're used. That they're used. There's probably shame and guilt and all kinds of different things. And maybe they don't talk about it all the time, but occasionally out underneath those stars, they converse about that. And these angels come to them. Now they hear of a king who can relate to their lowly estate. Now they understand there's a king that's coming, and he's just like us. He's come to us. He's come to bring something for us. The world offers a temporary peace based on the condition of value or your ability to contribute until you cannot. Hear that. Hear that. If you're running after things, it's not going to provide you peace. Your 401k is not going to provide you peace. It's going to run out. Your relationships are going to run out. Your health is going to run out. Oh, you're running strong. But eventually, you cannot. And that's where God can. And that's where he comes. He comes and he offers a peace that is eternal. And embedded in this message to this lowly shepherds is the very gospel and promise of God that has changed everything. And what an amazing, amazing peace. What we are given in Jesus Christ is lasting and permanent peace. Listen to what Jesus says in John 16, 32 through 33. Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. The emphatic is on him. In him we have peace. The thought there is there is no peace apart from him. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. As, as these angels declare this message of this baby that's going to be born, a king for them, embedded in this is a promise of an everlasting kingdom. Imagine. Imagine what they're thinking, what's going through their minds. Let's, let's look at this. 
In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. And they've been told their whole life that that's not for them. They've been told that. They feel that. They express it. So probably in their mind, they're thinking, well, that's for everybody else. That's for everybody else. I think we think that sometimes. We struggle with that. But listen to what he says, and Luke wants us to catch this. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you, for you, for you, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Luke personalizes it. He personalizes it. It's one thing to think, oh yeah, the Savior for everyone else. And subconsciously we think that. Oh, everyone else is better. Everyone else has this. Oh, they're worthy and they're all that. But the the angel specifically personalized this for the shepherds. And they say, for you. And now this message and this God in the flesh is for them. And immediately they're brought in. They're brought in. And that is a beautiful picture of the verse that I have in mind that Dennis and Judy talked about in Romans 5, 1 through 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not subjective. We have peace with God. Through whom also we have obtained. I love how it doesn't stop. It keeps going. Through whom we also obtain our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Do you hear the message of Christmas in there? And the government will rest on his shoulders. And there will be no end to the kingdom. I can imagine the shepherds talking about it as they're going. Did he just say what I thought he said? It's not going to end? Like we have a part? Like maybe he, he's actually going to be the Lamb of God? Amazing. And that's the amazing. Often we think of peace as an absence of conflict. Do not miss the fact that the Savior came for the outcasts, the poor, the sinners who were not accepted. The Savior came on a mission to bring them home and to make them whole. To make them whole. Maybe we're struggling with not having peace because we think we're worthy of it. And we're not. We're outcasts. We're sinners. We aren't aren't deserving of anything. We're not deserving of the Savior coming. But he came because he is love. He came because of what he wanted to do. He came to remedy for us. He chose to come to these shepherds. And he came to these shepherds and presented a message to them. Listen to Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders. Let that settle in your heart. We see a government that's in turmoil. We see a world that's in chaos. It's predicted. Have we read Revelation? It's predicted. But we don't believe in this government. We believe in a government we cannot see that rests on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. He needs no counsel. All or everyone in government needs counsel except Jesus Christ. Mighty God, eternal Father, Prince of Peace, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Imagine, no end. It just perpetually keeps getting better and better and better and better. On the throne of David and over his kingdom 
to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. I think that's so powerful, that ending. Because you and I aren't going to accomplish anything. He's going to accomplish it. He's the one that brings new birth. He's the one. It's his kingdom. That's where peace is. Why don't I feel peace at times? Because I think I have to do it. Right? Don't all of us struggle with that? Oh, I got to fix kids. I got to do this. I got to be involved in this. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And think of these shepherds. Catch this moment. Let the Holy Spirit bring you into this moment. Let him speak this to your heart. Be still. Don't think about everything else. Think about the Prince of Peace. You're in him. This message today is for you who is struggling with peace. Think about that. But the angel said, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there appeared with an angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. How does that happen? How can God be pleased with us? He can only be pleased with you because he crushed his son. Because he poured out his wrath on his son. And we get peace. And we get an eternal kingdom. And that's this message. That's the wonderful message of the incarnation. That's the beauty of Christmas. We're reminded over and over again of the gospel. The wonder, the astonishment moves to admiration and fear and then to absolute joy. What an amazing, amazing message that we've been given. Look at what they do. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. I think there's something there for us as I was thinking about that. Yesterday we met as elders and we talked about these pillars and we talked about evangelism and we, we talked about how there's fear over evangelism and I get it because when we think of evangelism we think, oh, I got to have the four spiritual laws and I got to do this and I got to do that and I got to do this as if it depends on us. These shepherds are going and relaying a message with it not absolutely not dependent on them. They're not adding anything to this. They're going to go share this good news. And they go in a hurry. Think about that. These shepherds are going to announce that there's a Savior. And they go and they go into this town of Bethlehem and all the sneers and all the things. And they go to worship the Savior. These shepherds took care of the lambs for the Passover, and the Savior has now come to take care of them. And they took off in a hurry and went to see this one that has brought them eternal peace. Wow. Where are you at this morning? Do you need peace? Peace is found in Jesus Christ, in Christ alone, who owns and has everything for you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and your grace and your goodness for us. Lord, I just sense you want to work in our hearts. Lord, that you want us to experience what the shepherds experienced. Peace in Christ. Renewed peace in Christ. 
understanding what we have in Christ. Lord, may you just move in our hearts, tabernacle in our hearts. Help us to understand what we have been given in Jesus Christ. And then we take off and tell as many people as possible. Lord, thank you. Lord, we want to worship you. We want to honor you. We live for the audience of one, Jesus Christ. Here we are, Lord. We're yours. In Jesus' name.